And welcome to Cardio Live. Today, I'm delighted to welcome two of Samuel Motor UK's executive team. It's Chairman Jim Tyrrell and Managing Director Nick Laird. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you both. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. Um, so just a little bit of background before we get going. Um, Jim joined Sangyong in 2017, a time when the brand really began to find its feet in the UK. Before that, Jim held the role of Managing Director of Mitsubishi Motors in the UK uh, until 2009, joining after nearly 15 years at Ford in various sales and marketing roles. Nick has uh, been at Sangyong since 2017 too, with just over two years in the seat as Managing Director. Before that, he had a rather varied career outside of uh, automotive, following 10 years at Ford in the 1990s. Um, Sangyong itself, of course, has seen some rapid growth in the last few years, increasing the size of its dealer network and launching some rather good-looking new models like the Tivoli and Karan. So thank you very much for joining us, chaps. Um, let's get cracking. I've got a lot of questions for you. Um, firstly, Jim, I'm going to turn to you. Um, you you've had some fantastic history uh, in the motor trade. What uh, attracts you to Sangyong um, and to get involved with that business? Um, well, I was asked to get involved um, about three years ago when the, the, the business, the sales have been growing in the UK, but um, probably at the expense of profitability in the business. So there were a few issues that needed looking at. And I had, I guess, some relevant experience working in an independent distributor, which is quite different from working for a manufacturer in the, the Mitsubishi business. The shape of the Mitsubishi business was quite similar to San Young. So the parent company, which is Basadone, based in Gibraltar, asked me to get involved. Um, I'm uh, sort of semi-retired. I'm, I'm maybe not quite old enough to be retiring, although I am starting to see a lot of my contemporaries from Ford stepping down at the moment as well. But um, so I didn't want to work full time, but I wanted to do, um, you know, a few days a month, which is what I do five or six days a month. Um, I was very interested in the challenge. I was very interested in the brand. I can see some parallels with the experience that we had in Mitsubishi. And, and you'll remember that we were successful in growing that uh, dramatically during the uh, early part of this century. So um, I saw it as an opportunity. Uh, Nick and I had known each other for a long time. We were at business school together. Uh, we lived across the road from each other and he happened to be available. So I asked Nick to come in and run the business. And, um, and I've been acting as chairman um, for the last three years now. So um, what have you been focused on in, in that time, Jim? I mean, what's, been the, what's been the number one priority? Well, there have been four or five priorities, really, but one of them was to get the basics right in the business, so get our ordering systems understood, get our reporting right, get the team motivated. Um, and and for the, from the perspective of this conversation, actually to do some um, really good work on thinking about how to recruit uh, dealers, how to motivate our dealers, how to operate in a market which is very competitive, but where we don't have huge budgets for advertising. So how can we be smarter about how we go to market? And over the last couple of years, I mean, how would you say things have gone? I would give us about seven out of 10. We've got the business stable. We, um, I mean, clearly one of the objectives was to break even. We wanted to, uh, we wanted to come away from some of the unprofitable business that was being done before. So the volume hasn't grown. Uh, but we have been able to increase margins both for us and for the dealers. And we were poised to grow with the launch of the new Corando. I think you may have seen that we were we invested very heavily on TV with an ad with, with Vinnie Jones. That was being very well received. We were just starting to see orders really ramp up. And then we got hit by the coronavirus. So very frustrating that having got to almost break even last year in the business and having decided that we were going to invest in growth this year, uh, the rug's kind of slightly been taken out from under our feet. So we will have to make adjustments this year. But I think overall we're, we're happy. Well, we were happy at Christmas. We were happy with where we got to. Um, we'll, we'll come on to the, uh, on to the coronavirus crisis in a moment. I'm just going to turn to Nick um, now. Nick, thank you also very much for joining us today. Um, you, what firstly, my question is, um, what, what attracted you to the brand? I mean, I, apart, from, apart from your friend Jim, of course. You assume that was an attraction, James. <laughs> um, uh, I, I've been in the, the auto industry at the beginning, uh, left for 15 years, 
and uh, then come back. And I must say one of the things I love about the auto industry is that it does things properly from start to finish. It was this lovely blend between the technology, the product, the psychology, the marketing, the customers, the deal. Uh, and you have a, so you have a complex product you're trying to put across in a simple way that customers understand. So I very much love the car industry and it does help that I love cars. Uh, one other thing, by the way, is I must apologize for the rather red hue that this uh, camera's got today. I'm not normally quite this red in real life. We'll, uh, we'll blame the camera, Nick, that's fine. Uh, Absolutely. So, Nick, you, you've been on quite the expansion um, over the last couple of years. A uh, number of new dealers have, have grown the franchise. One just down the road from me in, uh, in Gospel here, Fine Cars, joined, the, uh, joined your portfolio. How has that gone, and, um, and, and why have you been targeting such growth? We really believe in dealers, and we really believe, as a, as a smaller and challenger brand, that you need to get your product out there and the relationships that good dealers have in their markets in their local communities is really really important so we have been deliberately looking to try and find good quality dealers in all the areas where we have open points and have been delighted with the quality of some of the people we've been able to attract over the last couple of years uh find cars in gosport being one good example quite often we find these people have another franchise or it's their first step into an OEM a relationship. And what we try to be is, is simple and pragmatic and easy to do business with. You know, we, we deliberately try not to be too demanding on standards and complexity and systems and process and reporting and stuff like that. And, and try to get back to the kind of relationship that, uh, that car retailing used to be, not uh, in, with some OEMs what it's become. Nick, it's been a very interesting few weeks for the uh, for the most trade. It certainly kept me busy on the keyboard. Um, are you 100% convinced that dealers are going to be open on June the 1st? Certainly in England. We're receiving a, a lot of commentary. I've been on the phone to a couple of dealers only this morning where the inbound demand has quite surprised them over the last week. And there's a lot of prospect activity they are dealing with that, um, on the phone getting people asking about when can I test drive, when can I come and look at something, even customers in, I heard one story this morning of a, a customer in on after sales whilst they were getting their vehicle serviced, inquiring also about a, a, a purchase of a vehicle. So I, I think what we're seeing across the country is surprising bumps in demand at surprising times. Clearly no one knows how it's going to play out, um, but Certainly the experience that we've had, um, um, if you look at what happened elsewhere in the world, is that, that if you look after the customers, they will look after you. So we've been encouraging our dealers all along just to keep the conversations going with customers and prospects, to, to talk to them about what's happening and what's not happening, so that at least when you get to the end of it, they know who you are and they understand what you've been doing. Um, Jim, we were talking just before we came on air about the, the, you've got some very good contacts with the government. What are you hearing from, from your contacts about when uh, non-essential retail like car showrooms will be open? We are all hoping and praying it's going to be June the 1st, but we haven't had any official confirmations yet. Uh, I'm hearing the same thing. So uh, as I was telling you earlier, I've got a conference call with our local MP tomorrow morning and Matt Hancock, who... Uh, will, uh, I'm sure, give us more information. But I think the expectation is non-essential retail will start in June now uh, with the appropriate social distancing. And I don't see that um, there should be too many difficulties in car, car showrooms. Um, workshops have been open anyway. A lot of workshops have been open anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that we'll get back to work. Um, and from a macroeconomic perspective, one of the things that, of course, we're seeing is that um, we've got rather a two-speed economy at the moment. So many essential service workers and people uh, in supermarkets, in food production and so on, have not been affected economically at all by the events of the last month or two. And with 7 million people furloughed, while, yes, they've been on reduced income, um, they've also had reduced costs. So, again, we're expecting that the typical new car buyers are going to be still interested in buying new cars when this all comes to an end. Um, so, uh, and of course they, 
many of them are on two or three year cycles. So they kind of need to replace their cars. They need to have a conversation with their dealer, whatever it is at the point, you know, they're probably a bit delayed in having that conversation. So what I think will happen is that we will see a fairly quick return to near normality. But then what I'm slightly concerned about is when we get towards the end of the year and businesses start looking at their cost base and thinking, well, we may have had 100 people, but maybe we can cope with 90. We will start to see inflate, uh, unemployment come in. And I think that that could have an impact on the overall size of the economy and therefore the overall size of the car industry during next year. But I think we will see a bit of a bounce and then maybe it will slightly tail off. Um, Nick, I'm just going to turn to you now. Jim, thank you for that. I'm going to come back into to the uh, future into, into a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, but Nick, let's just rewind the clock ever so slightly to, to when this all kicks off. Um, what went through your head when you had to, to speak to dealers and, uh, and who were shutting their doors? And, and how has it affected your business? Look, it's been a an incredibly tough time for a load of people. You know, certainly the, the first week of what was going on, there was understandably a, a, a fair amount of panic around of people trying to figure out, what do I do? What don't I do? How do I survive this? How long is this going to go on for? And certainly that first week was a, a lot about trying to take a longer perspective and trying to, firstly, for dealers and for us, understand what's going to happen to income, cash income, what's going to happen to cash expenses, and how do you get the two in balance enough that you can see through the, the other side? Certainly then, very quickly, we've done a lot of dealer communications trying to say, do the right things for the medium term. Keep in contact with customers, do the right thing in communities, You know, look after people who are local to you, there are a number of ways one can do that without having either a large or possibly any cost at all. Um, so, you know, not a period any of us would like to go through again. Uh, let's hope we don't. Uh, but I'm sure for, for many businesses, it's forced all of us to look uh, inwards and outwards about what are we doing? What's the right structure? We see, for example, quite a lot of markets will be in growth, quite a lot of customer industries will be in growth at the end of this. Clearly, some will be in decline, and those are the ones that will get all the headlines. But if you're anything to do with the healthcare industry at the moment, then we are seeing a lot of both public and private investment going into that, which will endure. The, um, you, you're very right in, in, in saying that a lot of the headlines we see are very negative at the moment. It's quite nice to hear a, to hear a positive side to that story. How, how much do you think that balance is going to be when it comes to new car sales? I mean, which bit of it's going to outweigh? Is it, is it going to be those people who have actually done reasonably well during this time? Or is it going to be the fact that we are entering what is going to be quite clearly a, a very big recession? Yes, I, I think there's no doubt there will be a recession. Uh, I think at that point, uh, things like value messaging become very, very important, both for us as OEMs. Clearly, we're at the, at the value end of the spectrum anyway. So that should play well for us as a brand, but I'd certainly be recommending for all of the dealers to, to keep those local relationships tight. You know, one of the other learnings I've taken out of this is that the, the community bonds that have been formed in all sorts of strange places over these last few weeks have been brilliant. And if we can, uh, as, as dealers, as representatives of an industry, remain part of those local communities, then that will stand us well in good faith in, in, in the future. So I'd be encouraging every dealer to get involved in community stuff in a way that possibly none of us have done before. And that does not necessarily need to be free or high cost. Jim, what are your thoughts on a, um, on a scrappage scheme for the UK? It's been, it's been mooted quite, uh, quite a few times by a number of people I've been talking about. I mean, a, a, a scrappage scheme or similar stimulus, do you think it's needed to, to boost sales going forward? Uh, I think it is. I think we shouldn't hold our breath waiting for it. I think there's a, you know, the government has spent a lot of money on this um, coronavirus and whether they can find the extra millions or billions to... Um, to continue to support one specific industry, I'm not sure. But uh, if they were going to do anything, I think our view would be that a uh, scrappage scheme would be the fairest of the uh, of the various options that have been discussed. What um, what do you think that should look like 
Um, I mean, and what cars should they target? And do you think you'll be able to, to be able to benefit off the back of it? I think it needs to be across the board. If they're going to do something, it's got to apply to all vehicles. If they start trying to add a layer of complexity on top around emissions or uh, you know any other factor, I think it could it could get lost in the uh, it could just get lost in the wash. So my my view would be that you know if, if there's going to be a scrappish scheme, let it apply to all vehicles. You know to, to get older vehicles off the road clearly. You know so so a certain age of vehicles, but um, but not not in terms of which vehicle which new vehicles it can apply to. Nick, do you think one's likely, likely and, it, and if so, when, when would you like to see it introduced? The SMMT have been pulling together the thoughts of the various manufacturers and are presenting something to government. Um, I think it's possible that something will happen. Um, I think it would be helpful for the industry. Clearly, the government wants to stimulate um, it, um, people in employment. And so that applies both to the manufacturing side as well as to the retailing side. So we have to be aware on the retailing end that the government's focus is equally as much on getting manufacturing back working as it is on, on us who are selling and marketing cars. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that, that the government is listening. Whether we end up with something that they are happy with promoting, I, I don't know. I'm not close enough to that, but I'm hopeful. Have you had to delay any any other car launches over the next few few weeks and months um, because of what's happened? We've certainly had a couple of vehicles that were were due to be launched in the middle of the of the the last few weeks, so we've had to delay two sets of activity. But uh, such is life. Um, you know what what we've actually ended up doing with the demonstrators we've put on for those uh, events. For example, we have a a long wheelbase pickup truck um, is we've loaned out those vehicles to the NHS uh, for moving stuff around during this period. If, you know, if we were not giving those demonstrators to press, we may as well have used them effectively um, to the extent where we're now actually finding it quite difficult to get them back. So, uh, so yes, we have had to change activity and we'll have to reset that as the market comes back. Um, new vehicles for, for anybody are a big affair and as they are for us. So we'll look at different ways to launch them. And what about the plants in South Korea? I mean, they've, over there, they've managed to suppress the virus pretty well, haven't they? Um, is that affecting production at all? Um, for Sanyong, uh, production has not been affected at all throughout this period. Uh, so I think Korea has managed the virus very well, although obviously with a little blip more recently. Um, so I think there are some things we can learn and, and we've deliberately looked to learn on the retailing side from places like China that have been through it and come out the other side, where I understand in recent weeks, uh, demand is now currently above same time last year. So let's hope we get that same kind of bounce in the UK. Fingers crossed on that one. Um, Jim, on, in terms of the wider economy, I mean, how devastating do you think this crisis is going to be in terms of job losses and, and also specifically for the car industry? What are your thoughts? Because I know that you have a number of non-exec roles in other areas in other industries. Yeah, I think the uh, I mean, I've got five different non-exec roles and, and um, all of the companies have been differently affected, quite dramatically differently. I would say the car industry has probably um, car industry and the events industry one of my companies provides um public catering at um major sporting events and festivals and that's been uh, stopped completely so i think that um on the other hand i've got an engineering uh, involvement with an engineering business which has pretty much kept going at the same rate and a, and a food and drink company which has kept going at more or less the same rate so so it's really quite mixed what i think is probably going to happen is that some of those industries will be badly affected for the long term. So any business, tourism, um, uh, uh, events, anything like that, where most of their revenue comes during the summer period, of course, they've missed their revenue for this year and they've got to survive through the winter. And I think that will probably result in job losses in those industries, although they will be temporary job losses because those people will be required when we come back into next year, assuming that we've got um we've got uh you know a, a resumption of those events so my my feeling is that also as a result of that i think that many companies are starting to look at the way they do business and thinking well maybe we could do things a bit smarter here so maybe we could allow some of our people to work at home a bit more often 
um, maybe we could manage with slightly fewer people. So I think that even the businesses that come back to reasonably full strength fairly quickly, they may still be looking at, well, have I got a little bit of extra fat here that I could start cutting and so on. So I don't think we're going into a doomsday for, for uh, I think the government has done pretty much everything they could do in terms of the furlough scheme. I think everybody appreciates that. That will take us through to now September, October. Uh, and I think that when we get into next year, we will simply see the economy being down versus where it should be, but not not at the levels that it is now. I don't know. I'm not I'm not an economist, but that's kind of how I feel about things. I think many businesses are going to be thinking about how to do stuff differently. I mean, I certainly won't be going back to an office. I think we've, we've had discussions in my company about everybody working from home, and that probably will be the norm for many people, I'm sure, going forward. It's, it, and it's also going to have a big knock-on effect to the, to the way we sell cars, isn't it? And I think, Nick, can I ask you your thoughts on that? Because online retailing is really going to start becoming more important. What are you saying to your dealers about that going forward? Yes, I, I agree with you there. I think it will become more important. I think for us as a challenger, smaller brand, for whom many people don't know the brand, don't know the products, have never driven the car, may have never even seen one. We think there is still in the, in the long term a strong place for car dealers who can, who can bring back, I, I think you, you, you had um, um, someone on a couple of days ago um, who said, said the magic of, of new you know, that whole theatre of creating the new car sale. And I think we as an industry can do that very well, and we still believe in that. There is clearly going to be a place for online. There are clearly going to be a subset of customers for whom a more clinical, more distant, more analytical approach is better. We are developing ourselves at the moment uh, uh, an online selling tool set but as ever with our brand, we're going to do it relatively pragmatically and, and not gild the lily. So I, I think there's a full range of solutions out there for that. And I do expect them to accelerate, but I don't expect them to become the dominant part of the market. Because I, and the reason many dealers have, have flocked to online is because it was the only way that they could they could do business. I mean, Motorpoint gave an update to the uh, stock market this morning saying that they have they're, they're doing operations via contactless delivery um, and, and home delivery. Um, and that's managed and enabled them to go completely back to work. And there's been lots of dealers who've done that. I mean, my thoughts are that this is going to continue as many customers simply don't want to leave, leave home. Is that going to be something that, that, that you guys are going to be able to manage? Yes, we, we're working with the, the dealer body to try and find a a low cost pragmatic way for them to be able to sell online. You know, we still think there's a load of value add that dealers can provide and a load of confidence that dealers can provide to buyers during the process. So I very much see a, a part online, part offline process or, a, you know, part through a tool set, part through a video walk around a car, that kind of activity. But we certainly still see the, the, the good salesmanship and good relationship building and good qualification as skills that will endure. Um, how have your dealers managed during this, this current situation, Nick? I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously been an incredibly tough time. Were they set up well enough to, to, to ride this out? Yes, many of our dealers are, are relatively smaller in the, in the scale of the, of the ecosystem of, of dealer body. And, and as such, the, the owner of the business is often the dealer principal who knows all the employees and many of the customers by name. So the upside is they were very, very close to the operations of their businesses. It was quite easy for them to decide what to do and quick to make decisions. Um, all of our dealers closed for sales. Some kept on going distance. Many of them closed for after sales, but not all. So we saw a lot of them being, being very, very careful with cash outflows um, and, and, and are now coming back quite strongly. You know, I was speaking to one dealer the other day who, had, who is selling at the moment via distance and online 50% of his normal sales rate for April and May, which I was quite surprised at. So very, there's clearly activity out there. And if we are able to, to capture that in the right way, I, I like Jim, don't think it's a, it's a doomsday scenario. And, and certainly for us as a smaller brand, if, 
if if we get our our act together, we and our dealer body, then it's uh, there's more upside than there is downside. Jim, what are your thoughts um, on online retailing for cars? You've been in this industry long enough to see many many changes. I mean, do yeah. you, you see this as, as as a huge shift um, and a, and a new dawn of of selling cars? Look, I I've been famously sceptical um, for a long time. I can remember making speeches in conferences in the early part of 2000, 2000, 2001, when at that time, before you were born, James, I think, before um, when, you know, when many journalists were saying uh, the retail industry is dead, car showrooms are dead, we're going to internet uh, retailing. And at that time, I felt absolutely we were not. Um, what do I feel now? I think I don't feel as clearly that we're not moving in that direction. But, but I think all of the things that Nick said in terms of the, the theater of new car sales and um, the relationship that dealers have with customers. And when you overlay that with the fact that um, customers don't particularly know our product, I think there'll be some kind of hybrid approach to uh, internet retailing. But I still think that dealers are a vital link in this, in this, um, in this equation. And I don't, I don't see... You know, certainly for us, I don't see any um, potential that we will move away from the traditional route of dealers selling the cars. Um, Nick, Jim at the start of this spoke um, about your performance up to the period of the lockdown. Can we just go into that into a little bit more detail and, and, and your thoughts on how quickly you can get back to that position? I was concerned there you meant my personal performance before <laughs> the lockdown rather than our corporate one. Um, we... Um, we think the market will rebound fine, particularly for given where we are with value-based product. We have some reasonably good incentives out there in the market at the moment. Clearly, we are going to review and refresh them as things come back. But we're pretty optimistic that we'll be able to occupy our little niche in the marketplace and our dealers will be able to sell cars well and profitably. Have you changed your goals now on increasing the size of the network because of this? Strangely, we, we see some areas where it might become more difficult and other areas where it might become easier, actually. There are a, a number of other manufacturers who are changing their representation approach and, and a number of dealers out there who, who may be losing a brand. And for many of them, a, uh, a low-cost, pragmatic partner like us might make perfect sense. So um, we would certainly be open to talk to people, even in these strange times. Um, tell me a little bit about the Vinnie Jones uh, decision. I mean, what, how did that come about and uh, why did you go with it? Uh, Jim, do you want to talk about that first and I'll fill in the bits you don't? Um, well, we, um, we felt that we had got the brand to a position where the... Um, the fundamental issue that we had was awareness. So we wanted, we wanted to build the awareness of the brand. Uh, you know, traditional marketing says that uh, it's a funnel down from, you know, high levels of awareness to uh, customer interest through to inquiry, through to demonstration, and then through to sales. So we wanted to widen the funnel at the top. Um, we were looking for something which represented our, uh, no-nonsense approach to the market. Uh, we also wanted to um, we wanted to show what a good-looking car it is, um, and we wanted to give it credibility. And we had a couple of options uh, for the kind of characters that we felt could properly present our or could present our product with interest. And uh, actually, Vinny was top of the list. We didn't think we could afford him. Uh, we didn't think we would attract him. But actually, he was. He likes the product. Um, he uh, has quite a big countryside um, uh, interest and he saw the relevance uh, to his lifestyle. Um, so he was quite keen to do it. And uh, we, we like the way it turned out. It's a terrible shame that we spent most of our money in February uh, in the lead up to the March market. But we, we will continue to use the ad during the rest of the year as well. Yeah, just to add on to that, James, the, the ad was working very well for us. Um, at it, all the way through the funnel, but particularly at the front end of the funnel, so website activity and dealer lead activity, it did a, a superb job for us. And of course, what we were trying to do there was, on the one hand, it does what it says on the tin, 
and on the other hand, have a bit of a sense of humor about ourselves as well. So we were trying not to be quite too, uh, too corporate about the whole thing. Um, Nick, do you think the government's done enough to help this industry out through this period? Uh, the, the government has, has done an incredible amount of stuff from a standing start in a way that, uh, well, put it this way, I, would, I would, wouldn't be overly comfortable with the jobs of any of them at the moment. I think they are having to make some super tough decisions with probably next to no information and uh, guessing what the future is going to hold. So I have, a, I have a lot of respect for people who are in that position. What about you, Jim? I mean, do you think they've done enough to help out this industry? I think, um, I think from an economic point of view, I would probably give the government eight out of 10. I think they've, I think they've reacted, I mean, in a way which you wouldn't expect a Conservative government necessarily to react. I think from a health management perspective, I think they missed a few opportunities at the very beginning. They were obviously, as Nick said, they were running from a standing start, but allowing the Cheltenham Race Festival to go ahead, allowing Twickenham, you know, international rugby to go ahead, I think probably, um, uh, probably caused more infections at the beginning than, uh, than, they, than we would now have liked. Um, but I think, it, as Nick says, I think it's a terribly difficult job. Now, you're asking really the question, are they going to do, do we want them to do anything specifically to support the motor industry? We'd like them to, clearly. We would like some kind of a scrap, scrappage scheme that could also help them with other environmental objectives. So we would be keen for that. But we mustn't underestimate the extent to which there will be competing voices from other industries. As I said to you earlier, I'm involved in the events industry, which has been crucified by this because of the calendarization of their income. So they will be getting lots of lobbies, lobbying from lots of different uh, industries to act, and there will be a limit to what they can do. Um, Jim, finally to you, what's the most important thing this crisis has taught you? Um, it's taught me, I, I would say it's taught me to think about how we do things. I, I mean, I'm fairly traditional, really. You know, I've been around a long time. I'm used to big teams of people sitting in offices talking to each other. And I think there's an opportunity for us as a business. Uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think in, in many businesses, there are opportunities for us to allow people to work from home, which will have benefits in terms of their lifestyle, how they manage their lives. It'll have cost benefits in the medium term in terms of the size of offices that we require. But I think we mustn't go over the top on that either because we must, we must recognize the value of the office environment to people to allow them to mix with their colleagues, to share ideas, to get support as well. So what we will be looking to do probably is some kind of hybrid approach where we allow people to work from home two or three days a week, but we require them to come into the office so that we can still know each other. So I think um, it's about yeah. that. Thank you, Jim. Um, Nick, Nick, same question to you. What's this crisis taught you? Yeah, certainly some of the things that Jim mentioned. I, I think the other thing for me that has been surprising and positive is the humanity that comes through in, in a lot of interactions with people you didn't previously talk to. You know, even just walking down the street, there's a lot more humanity there. And that's one of the reasons why I talked a bit earlier about community and being involved in your local community. That's one of the things it has taught me is to, is to appreciate more the value of relationships. Um, so, so I think if we can keep some of the positives out of that, you know, it might slow us down a little bit in terms of how we deal with others. But if it does that in a positive manner, then the depth of relationships and therefore over time, the, the depth of revenue that comes from that might be better. So I'm not doing that wholly from a, I'm not saying that wholly from an altruistic point of view. I'm doing it, saying it because it, it feels to be right for both the, the human element and the commercial element. And I have to say that I'm, I've known Nick Laird 30 years and I've never heard him talk about humanity. So something's happened to him in the last two months. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice to see there's been some changes there, Nick. <laughs> uh, thank you ever so much to both of you. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you, and I'll, I'll wish you all the best with uh, getting your business going again over the uh, over the next few weeks and months. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Thanks, James.
Great stuff. So um, coming up uh, on Cardio Live over the next few days, well, tomorrow we've got Pendragon CEO Bill Berman. He's uh, announced a, a set of results, or a, a trading update this morning to the stock market, chatting to him tomorrow about what that means. It's a bank holiday again on Monday. The only reason I know that is because it means I don't have to do one of these. So I'm going to have a little break, but I'll be back on Tuesday with Eden Motor Group CEO Graham Potts. On Wednesday, it's Cap HPI. Thursday, Big Motor in World's Larger Than Life boss Peter Waddell. And on Friday, it's Trust Ford CEO and Chairman Stuart Folds and their marketing director, Julia Greenhoe. Well, hopefully, I've said that correctly. I'm sure she'll correct me next week. Anyway, if you want to get involved in cardio lives like this, give me an email. It's james at blackballmedia.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter at Cardio the Red or on LinkedIn. Send me a message there. The other thing is, if you want to join our WhatsApp breaking news group, send me a message and I'll send you a link. And lastly, Cardiola Magazine's latest digital issue has been updated to our website, cardiolamagazine.co.uk. You can download it free of charge or read it on the issue app. You'll find a full schedule for Cardio Lives on the website too. Okay, thanks once again to uh, Nick and Jim today for their time. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs>